Hello, this is Russ Walden with Father's Heart Ministry, and this is the Morning Light Daily Bible Study. Today we are studying in Luke chapter 14, the path of humility. In Luke 14, Jesus again, as in the previous chapter, sits down to supper with a group of Pharisees. He'll hang out with anybody. The Pharisees at this supper are jostling one another, vying for the most honorable tables, and just making an embarrassment of themselves. Jesus observes this and teaches on the necessity of choosing the path of humility in our interactions with others. Humility is a potent weapon of spiritual warfare. Without it, our testimony is damaged and our lives are made shipwreck. We'll begin by reading the entire chapter in its entirety. When it came to pass, as he went into the house of one of the chief Pharisees to eat bread on the Sabbath day, that they watched him. And behold, there was a certain man before him which had the dropsy. We'll talk about what that is. And Jesus answering spake to the lawyers and the Pharisees, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath day? And they held their peace. And he took him, he took the man, and healed him and let him go. So he didn't just say something to him, he grabbed him. And he answered them, saying, Which of you shall have an ass or an ox fallen into a pit and will not straightway pull him out on the Sabbath day? He had already talked to them in the previous chapter about the fact that they watered their livestock on the Sabbath, but they were upset that he was healing on the Sabbath. And they could not answer him again to these things. And he put forth a parable to those who were bidden when he marked how they chose out the chief rooms saying unto them, When you are bidden of any man to a wedding, sit not down in the highest room, lest a more honorable man than you be bidden of him to come up higher. And he that bade thee and him come and say, Give this man place, and you begin with shame to take the lowest room. But when you are bidden, go and sit down in the lowest room, that when he that bade thee comes, he may say to you, friend, uh, come up higher. Then will you have worship in the presence of them that sit at meet with you. For whosoever exalts himself will be abased, and whoever humbles himself shall be exalted. Then he said unto him that bade him, when you make a dinner or a supper, don't call your friends or your brothers, neither your kinsmen nor your rich neighbors lest they also bid you again, and a recompense is made to you. But when you make a feast, call the poor, the maimed, the lame, lame, and the blind, and you will be blessed, for they cannot recompense you, for you shall be recompensed at the resurrection of the just. And when one of them sat at meat with him, heard these things, he said unto him, Blessed is he that shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. And then he said unto him, A certain man bade a sup made a great supper and invited many. And he sent his servant at supper time to say to them that were bidden, Come, for all things are now ready. And they all with one consent began to make excuses. The first said unto him, I have bought a piece of ground, and I must go and see it. I pray thee have me excused. And another said, I bought two, five yoke of oxen, and I go to prove them. I pray thee have me excused. And another said, oh, I've married a wife. How many people use their marriage, their spouse, as an excuse not to obey the call of God in their life? I've married a wife, therefore I cannot come. So that servant came and showed his Lord these things. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to the servant, Go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city and bring in the poor, the maimed, and the halt, and the blind. And the servant said, Lord, it is done as you have commanded, and there is yet room. And the Lord said unto the servant, Go out into the highways and the hedges and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. For I say to you, that none of those men which were bidden shall taste of my supper. And there went out great multitudes unto him, 
And he turned and said unto them, If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, in his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whosoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you intending to build a tower sitteth not down first and counteth the cost whether he have sufficient to finish it? Lest haply after he hath laid the foundation and is unable to finish it, uh, all that behold it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build, but he was not able to finish. Or what king, going to make war against another king, sits not down first, and consulteth whether he be able with ten thousand to meet him that cometh against him with twenty thousand? Or else, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends an embassage and desires conditions of peace. So likewise, whosoever be of you that forsaketh not all that he has, can not be my disciple. Salt is good, but if the salt hath lost its savor, wherewith shall it be seasoned? It is neither fit for the land nor for the dunghill, but men cast it out. He that hath an ear, let him hear. So what is the salt? The salt is the resolve to forsake all and come follow Jesus. That's what makes you salty in the kingdom of God. So we see here in Luke 14, 1, Jesus again enters into the house of a Pharisee for a meal on the Sabbath. One of the people in the household was afflicted with something called the dropsy. Go back to the beginning of our chapter. Uh, now, what is this condition called dropsy? Medical dictionaries today define this as edema, swelling of the soft tissues usually around the legs and the ankles, sometimes due to congestive heart failure. Jesus observes the man's condition, and before acting, he asks a question of those at the table. Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath day? And they don't want to answer him, at which point Jesus ignores him and he takes the man, heals him, and lets him go. So what does it mean that he took the man? This was more than merely pronouncing the man well with a spoken word. The original language word in this passage that he took the man suggests that Jesus seized the man in his arms and handled him in some way to rescue him from his affliction. After letting the man go, Jesus turns to the Pharisees and says, ask them whether or not does the law allow for an ass or an ox to be rescued from a pit on the Sabbath? Uh, they don't want to answer him because they know it does allow. The law did not prohibit such actions. Still, it was against the rabbinic traditions. They were more spiritual than the word of God itself. Uh, even though these strict Pharisees at the table admitted they were doing such things, they taught the opposite and required the people not to do what they themselves did. And certainly they were more interested in seeing their livestock pulled out of a ditch than seeing some sick person healed. So to them, people were lower than animals. So they're seeking an occasion against Jesus. Then Jesus changes the subject. In verse 7, he observes the guests are vying for the best seats in the best rooms in the house. He comments on this in verse 8, saying that one should not expect to be seated at the head of the table, but rather be willing to take the lower seat. Now, in taking the lower place, if the host would bid you come to a more honorable position, then you're not going to be shamed by asking to move to a less honorable position. So what is the lesson here? Jesus is doing more than giving us an Emily Post etiquette lesson. In verse 11, he concludes that whoever, he sums up, whoever exalts himself will be abased, but the humble shall be exalted. So when you are in the midst of contention or in any social setting, Always go low in humility. Why? Because Solomon said in the Proverbs that contention only comes by pride, and it does not add to that unless you are right. 
No, contention, whether you're right or not, contention always comes by pride. Learn to go low in humility. Humility is a powerful weapon of spiritual warfare. It is the one attribute that Satan cannot, that Satan cannot counterfeit because he never had any humility. When you humble yourself by your actions, you put yourself in a position to be exalted by the hand of God every time. Jesus then instructs in verse 12 that when you host a social activity, call in the undesirables before you call your friends siblings, or influential neighbors. Now, why would you do this? Because they cannot return the favor. For this reason, Jesus says, you will then be recompensed by God himself in ways that men cannot pay you back. This is the law of unreturned benevolence. In Proverbs 19.17, Solomon puts it this way. Turn there to Proverbs 19.17. He that has pity upon the poor makes a loan to the Lord, and that which he has given to the poor, God will repay back to him again. God takes a personal interest in blessing those that champion the cause of the poor. Now this goes beyond institutional giving. When giving to the poor, you should do it personally, if at all possible. Then institutionally, if you must. The idea of inviting people to your social setting implies letting these people into your life on an intimate level. This is one of the most frustrating aspects of Jesus' personality to the Jews and the Pharisees, the scribes, and the Sadducees because Jesus was continually placing himself in the company of publicans, sinners, and harlots, marginalized and despised people. You know, many Christians get wounded because they seek the company of those above them and they get rebuffed and they get church hurt. But is this being persecuted for righteousness or is it a point of correction regarding the company we keep? You will never, you will seldom, if ever, be rebuffed when you seek out the marginalized, the outcasts, or the, the neglected. Learn to walk into humility walk in the place of humility, and to give to others the honor that you desire for yourself. Jesus then gives a parable of a great supper and many invitations that are sent out. But those that were bidden with one consent gave excuses as to why they would not, could not attend. What is the significance of this parable? When those that were bidden refused to come, the host instructs that the servants go into the highways and the byways and compel them to come in. Who were they compelling to come in? The undesirables. What is the lesson here? The principle expressed here is the very basis on which the gospel, spurned by the Jews, was then offered to the Gentile nation. Were it not for this character trait in the heart of God, you and I would be yet in our sins, for salvation would only be for the Jews. Because those to whom Jesus was sent rejected his message, now they are excluded. Paul declares in the book of Romans that the Jewish nation was rejected as a, as a natural olive branch, because they did not produce fruit, and the wild olive branches of the Gentile peoples would then be grafted in to the plan of salvation. Now, why were the Jews rejected? Because of unbelief. Paul then warns us not to fall after the same manner of unbelief. Unbelief, skepticism, sarcasm, pessimism, and doubt those things exclude us from the banquet of good things that God has prepared for us both now and in eternity. Of course, the Pharisees, they were very lukewarm in their esteem for Jesus. But at the same time, verse 25 says, multitudes clamored after him. 
The common people received his message gladly, but in verse 26, even them, he warns them of the cost. If we are to follow after Jesus and we do not hate our closest kinfolk, we are not accepted as a disciple of Jesus. That word, original language word for hate is very powerful language. It means to detest or to love less. How many times have we experienced pressure from loved ones in our walk with God? Jesus looked down through time and he saw what a difficult thing many believers would face because their spouse, their wife, their husband, their children, their siblings, family members would bring per pressure and persecution against them because, they're, because of their commitment to Christ. In saying that they could not be his disciple without deciding that issue, Jesus isn't saying that he would reject them. He is saying that they would be unable to follow him fully until they settled this very sensitive issue. This, verse 27 tells us, is the cross we are called to bear. Now remember, Jesus carried his cross and we must carry ours. His cross was to bear the sins of the world. You and I can't do that. Our cross is to endure the rejection, even of our close loved ones, yet remain faithful. As a builder erecting a building, Jesus says, or a captain going out to war, we must count the cost and decide beforehand that we will pay the price, the, full, the last full measure of following Jesus, lest we get up in the midst of the effort and fall short and to our own shame and to the destruction of our testimony. Making this resolve, verse 34 tells us, is what makes us. Our resolve is our salt and our resolve is our light in the earth. It's painful when estrangements come from family members that we hold dear in our hearts. There's no pleasure in going years and years without communication with parents or children. But it does happen. And we must make up our mind that we're going to follow Jesus as best we can, even if it means loss of fellowship, loss of relationship, even with those closest to us. God bless you.